Welcome to Shattering Miss, a program devoted to the most important and hopefully fastest growing segment of society. To those who, like me, know that the world's political, religious, military, and economic institutions are corrupt, that they are counterproductive, that they cannot be fixed, that we'd be wasting our time to try to resolve their issues. Our mission, therefore, is to look behind the headlines, to know who is working against our interests, to understand why they're doing so, to have a better understanding of what they're doing. Because exposing and condemning errant and treacherous schemes isn't hateful, it's caring. In our concluding hour, we're going to use evidence and reason to explore the Torah, which, as you know, means teaching, not law because it's liberating, enriching, and empowering covenant <clears throat> provides the only reliable answer for you and your family. Our phone number, if you'd like to participate in this discussion, anytime over the next three hours is 877-300-7645, although you may want to hold off in the initial segment, because I'm going to jump right back down into the most uh, difficult arena in the public speech today. Yesterday, I uh, shared my uh, frustration with the Uganda law, which uh, criminalizes homosexual behavior, and whereby a person who engages in homosexuality, even in the privacy of their own home, on the first offense, is going to face 14 years in prison. And on the second offense, they will be locked up for the remainder of their life. Worse, it is now a crime in Uganda not to report a suspected homosexual. The media there is even outing uh, leading homosexuals, revealing their name, their position, their addresses. They're uh, making them criminals on the run. In my view, a person ought to be able to do whatever they want. Now, there are choices that uh, are not good. I am personally not in uh, sympathy with the choice to use drugs, although I think you ought to be free to do so. I do not support homosexuality, though I think you ought to be free to express uh, sexuality any way that you want, so long as your expression doesn't, A, involve a, uh, a minor, doesn't B, uh, abuse someone that you have um, taken control over, as in rape, pedophilia in the first case, rape in the second case. And third, that you don't try to promote that which is abnormal outside of a man and woman coming together as husband and wife to uh, make love and conceive children that you don't promote the alternative to that, whatever it might be, as glorified, as, as superior, as something that the rest of society must embrace and respect. But the law in Uganda just says, no, you can't do it. If you do it, we're going to imprison you. you know, God conceived us with free will. He is not the least bit supportive of homosexuality, particularly of pedophilia. But that doesn't change the fact that you're free to do so. It's just that there's a consequence. Now, the reason I brought this up again is that the Arizona governor, Jan Brewer, a Republican, vetoed a controversial bill yesterday that would have allowed businesses in the state to deny services, as it says here, to gays and lesbians if they felt that serving them would violate their religious rights. As the listeners to this program know, I am not religious. I am anti-religious. I do not care about religious rights other than I think that people ought to be free to be Christian or be Muslim or be socialist, secular humanists, Hindus, even Mormons and Scientologists, if they want to be. So long as their religion isn't promoted and, and demanded of others, I don't care what stupid choices people make. That's their business. They can squander their soul and their life any way they wish. 
But that's not what's happening in America anymore. What's happening in America is that there is a national religion. It's socialist secular humanism. And it's the only religion that you are allowed to practice. That is the case with this particular bill. It is the case with the federal judges in Virginia and Texas in the last week overturning the people's will, the people's votes, where they voted that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Now, the reason this is being pushed as an agenda is because it goes all the way back to Adam Weishaupt and the creation of his illuminated, uh, Illuminist order. He wanted to come up with a a enlightened group of men who would rule over other men and so that monarchies and clerics wouldn't have control. He wanted to wrench control from monarchs and clerics and give it to people like himself who he thought were more enlightened than the average person. It was the basis of communism. It was the basis of what we call today socialist secular humanism. Man becomes God and enlightened men are the ones who should be empowered. That has become the national religion of America. Political correctness is the replacement moral code. Now, Adam Weishaupt recognized that there was no way that he was going to prevail in the promotion of his religion unless he undermined the religions that he was up against, primarily Christianity. And since he was working on behalf of the adversary, he also had to undermine that which was important to Yahweh. Nothing is more important to Yahweh than the covenant. The covenant is based upon marriage. In fact, bereth, the Hebrew word for covenant, means marriage vow, in addition to family relationship. So if they set their sights at redefining what that means, such that it was in opposition to what Yahweh had conveyed, then ultimately their moral code and their religion would overcome and prevail. That is why we are in the place that we are today. And the imposition of socialist secular humanism as the national religion, and I'll go back to the Arizona case here in just a moment, is, uh, is almost universal. Today, judges are the priests of America's fixation on imposing the religion of socialist secular humanism. Those who are the propagandists are teachers. The media serves as the evangelists for socialist secular humanism. It's pervasive. In this um, Arizona bill, the reason that the law was passed by the legislature is because a federal judge, when reviewing a, uh, a case that was filed uh, by uh, two uh, gay individuals, homosexual individuals, against a photographer. A photographer said, I don't want to, to shoot pictures uh, of a homosexual wedding. It's not something I'm comfortable doing. And so, as a photographer, this individual, I don't know if it was a man or a woman, said, I don't wish to do that. And so the homosexual couple, rather than just finding another photographer who would be willing to shoot pictures, wanted to make it a law that, that a person's individual choice no longer mattered that they had to adhere to the socialist, secular, humanist religion. And so a federal judge heard the case and decided that the photographer had no choice, that they must capitulate. Now, that ruffled a lot of feathers. Now, I am a photographer, pretty darn good photographer. I love photography. I would not feel comfortable being employed to memorialize a homosexual wedding. I don't care if homosexuals want to declare their love for one another. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't care if a homosexual couple wishes to uh, to live together. Got no issue with that. Got no issue with what they do and the privacy of of their home. Whatever they wish to do is certainly fine with me. I don't care. 
But I don't want to be memorializing what they're doing when, when personally I don't view it as being something that, that is appropriate. Now, that doesn't mean that, that my view of this should influence what they can do. But I don't need to be ordered to memorialize it. My view happens to be very similar to Yahweh's view. In fact, it's as similar as, as I'm capable of making it, which is you're free to choose. Do whatever you want, just so long as you understand God's view of homosexuality. And it's, it's not positive. So, you know, if you want to have a view that is in conflict with the creator of the universe, that is your choice. You're welcome to uh, to have one. But be careful. So in this particular case, what we have is the imposition of a nationalized religion on uh, the citizens of Arizona by the judge's uh, verdict against the photographer. And so the Arizona governor, because the NFL, which I think tarnished its image in this case, put pressure on the Arizona governor to veto the bill. Senator John McClown was on the wrong side as well. Now, I'm telling you here, folks, that, that what happened with the federal judge in Virginia, the federal judge in Texas overturning the people's voice, which was that Marriage should be between a man and a woman. This war on traditional marriage, which is a war on the covenant. It's a war on Yahweh. It is a, it is a propagandist campaign to replace the values that Yahweh has established in his Torah, his teaching regarding his covenant with the religion of man. Before I share a statement with you from uh, the Torah, I want you to know that I would not encourage you to do as those are doing in Arizona who are opposed to this veto. Don't engage. This battle has already been lost. The vast preponderance of young people today have been so indoctrinated in school all the way up through college that they see nothing wrong with this, and that can't be solved. We are in a position now where the, uh, the government has absolutely decided that there will be one religion that can be practiced freely, and that any other religious views, including uh, the decision not to be religious, won't be tolerated. The religion that is taught and doctrinated all the way through the education process is socialist secular humanism, and every aspect of it is indoctrinated. And any expression that would be counter to it is immediately rebuffed. In the media, the evangelists of socialist secular humanism, if anyone makes any statement that is uh, deemed to be counter to the imposition of socialist secular humanism and all of its proclivities, particularly related to uh, endorsing, uplifting, promoting homosexuality, they're drummed out of business. They're publicly crucified. Same thing is true in politics. Uh, in academia, it would be instant death to your career. Yes. Total death. No matter if you say something that is the least bit even perceived as not being in support of homosexuality. You'll lose your job in academia. You'll lose your job in the media. You'll lose your job in politics today. That's where we are. And those imposing it from a putting the teeth of the government behind it are judges. Now, there's no reason to fight this. 
So all of you little Christians out there that, you know, are tea partiers and, uh, and politically conservative and say, I won't stand for it. You know, I'm going to, going to vote the bums out of office. It's, you're wasting your time. This battle has already been lost. It was lost a long time ago, particularly in uh, the nation's uh, public schools. Lost a long time ago. You can't. You fell asleep at a time where you probably could have done something. You can't anymore. It's time that you, you join the rest of us who have realized that your government has let you down. Your media has let you down. That your judges are now counterproductive. It's time that you walk away from these things. You can't fix them. But you can fix your relationship with God. Yesterday, a, a very regular contributor to this program, a fellow who is uh, well-read and very articulate, uh, cited from um, a traditional English translation a um, a statement that that would indicate that uh, God wants us to kill homosexuals. And my response to him uh, was that uh, that's not what God said. That uh, what he actually said was that that those who corrupt deliberately corrupt purposefully corrupt the symbolism that's associated with his family oriented covenant relationship since that's the most important thing to him the covenant that they're going to die that the only way for one to have life eternal and to be adopted into God's family and to live forever with him is to embrace the terms and conditions of the covenant and uh, and the ongoing practice of homosexuality so corrupts the idea of of mothers and fathers raising and protecting children which is the essence of the covenant that God says that such individuals that practice such things are going to die and uh, he says no 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 I beg to differ that isn't what it says well it is what it says now, I'm going to read it to you today. Now, I I'm, I'm, do not want to, and he's probably listening, to be uh, critical of uh, this particular caller because the uh, uh, what he was reading, he was reading it correctly. It's just that it was a very inadequate uh, and incomplete and therefore misleading translation. Here's what God said. This was the passage that he was quoting from. It's Kara called out, Leviticus 2013. I should put it in context. And, and what what precedes this is a whole host of perverse behaviors. It's it's primarily focusing on incest and pedophilia. And uh, God is not the least bit accepting of incest or pedophilia. No. Prior to knowing God's view on this or studying God's view on this, I recognize that the single most repulsive thing a human being can do is to be a pedophile. One of the things that I detest most about Muhammad and Islam, Muhammad was a pedophile. It is one of the things I detest most about the Roman Catholic Church. It not only uh, has huge numbers of pedophilic priests, but they cover it up. They aid and abet pedophilia to try to salvage their reputation. Now the music is playing, so once we return from the commercials, I'm going to share with you an accurate and complete translation of Leviticus 2013. Welcome back to Saturday Mist. I'm going to share now the uh, the passage that uh, is used to make. Uh, Yahweh seem uh, mean-spirited, seem like he's out of touch with uh, today's uh, reality. Here's what God actually said. Now, keep in mind that this is in a long list of, uh, of God using the same terms, presented the same way to... Provide a a list, and this is uh, it's very uncommon for God even to provide this kind of list. But this is instructions to us on the kinds of things that God sees as detestable, and this list is almost entirely comprised 
of things that would be categorized as incest or pedophilia or both. Okay, so this is about don't have uh, sex with your uh, uh, your mother, don't have sex with your mother-in-law, don't have sex with your father-in-law, don't have sex with your son, don't have sex with your daughter, don't have sex with your sister. You know, incest and pedophilia, almost uh, universally. And an individual who is part of a relationship actually and habitually lies down and has sexual intercourse with a boy while in bed with a woman and completely engaged in they are completely engaged in I should say something repulsive and detestable the two are genuinely dead and shall forever cease to exist. Death is within them. All right, so let's let's analyze uh, what God has um, said here. So it's the individual. It's Ish. Yeah, there's a lot of Hebrew words for man, and the the primary Hebrew word for man. If God wanted us to just to render this man, He would have used. Uh, Adam, A-D-A-M. He didn't. He used ish. Ish is the Hebrew word for individual. Now, there's two forms of ish, masculine and feminine, and both are used in this particular statement. So this would be a masculine individual. So are there some indications, some reason for using individual uh, as opposed to man? Yeah, perhaps, maybe because it, there is... No association of age associated with individual. There is with with um, man an implication of, of being older. But an individual who is part of a relationship, this is Asher, actually and habitually lies down and has sexual intercourse. This is stock, Abba. In reality makes a practice of continually sleeping. And it's going to be followed with with or against F. Now, the reason that I, I wrote this is actually and habitually. I'm making a practice of continually sleeping or having sexual intercourse with. And what follows is a boy is because this was written in the call imperfect. <clears throat> and if we ignore the stems and conjugations in Hebrew, then we have zero chance of having an accurate understanding of what is being conveyed. There is a reason, for example, that each of the seven instructions that follow the three sweeping statements that were etched on those two tablets of stone, there is a reason that all seven instructions were written in the imperfect. God isn't saying, for example, in those instructions, nor here, that if you uh, engage in a single act of, of um, pedophilia or homosexuality, and actually it's a combination of, of both here, that uh, you're going to die. Doesn't say that. He uh, says you can make a practice of it. If it's an ongoing part of your life, it's the same thing in each of these seven instructions. If you make a practice of disregarding the Shabbat, God is not pleased. If you make a practice of killing, God is not pleased. God doesn't want you to make a practice of lying, a habit of lying. He doesn't want you to make a habit of being covetous and, and taking that which is not yours. There are... The instructions are, don't make a habit of, don't make a practice of, for example, killing. You know, if, if it were not written in the imperfect with those instructions, as is the case here, then a single act would put us at cross purposes with God. But if and since, not if, but since they were written in the imperfect, if you were a soldier, for example, and you were trained to kill, and you did kill, 
But you are no longer a soldier. You're no longer engaged in killing. Or if you were a Christian evangelist, as I was, and you deceived people, as I did, as a Christian evangelist, the moment I stop doing it, I am no longer at odds with God in this issue because it speaks of don't make a practice of, a habit of, don't continually mislead. Very false witness. It is extraordinarily important that you understand how the conjugations affect the meaning of the verbs. So this is saying the individual who, who habitually, on an ongoing basis, lies down and has sexual intercourse with a boy, Zakar. Now, this is typically translated man. And so it's, and people just stop reading right there and say, oh boy, and then they'll skip to uh, the translations which say uh, they should be put to death. The uh, reality is that's not the the proper translation of the verbs at the end of the sentence. But more importantly, zakar is used to describe a male child in Numbers 31.17. But it's most commonly used to depict a son, as it is in the case of this same um, discussion. And Leviticus 12.2, just the previous use of it, it depicts a son. And Yasha Yah, 67.7, depicts a son. And Yerma Yah, 20.15, depicts a son. In the instructions on circumcision, Zakar is used to depict a son. A person who habitually lies down with and has sexual intercourse with a son. An adolescent boy. A child is what God is saying. While in bed with a woman. He's even making it going even further. So he's in bed with a woman, an Isha. Could be his wife, could be his mother, could be uh, a just a female individual. So he's in bed with a woman, and, uh, and this individual has lured a boy, perhaps his son, into bed. And is having on a regular basis, sexual intercourse with a child while in bed with a woman. God says that that person is genuinely and completely engaged in, Asha, is actually doing something which is repulsive and detestable. No kidding. It is repulsive. It is detestable. It's an abomination. It's loathsome. It's abhorrent, Toba. The two, both of them. Now he's, he's speaking about the woman, probably the mother of the boy, the wife of the man, who has participated in this. So it's the two. It's not the, the, the son. It's not the child who has been victimized here. But the husband and wife, the, the couple, the man and woman who lured the child in to perpetrate sexual intercourse, abusing him on an ongoing basis in this way, God says they're repulsive. What they have done is detestable. It's an abomination. It's loathsome. It's abhorrent. No, it's true. I'm not going to get an argument from me, I'll tell you. My perspective as well. I hope it's yours. Then this is what follows, and it follows every one of these discussions of what God is saying. He's providing instruction. He says, this is not good, man. This is really disgusting. This is repulsive. Don't do this. He doesn't even say don't do it. He's just saying, it's repulsive. You know, you'd think that once you know that it's repulsive, it's bad, it's it's horrible to do, that you choose not to do it. God isn't even saying don't do it. He's just saying it's repulsive. Then he says the two are genuinely dead. Muth. Are already destroyed and literally deprived of life. You see, the first Muth, and Muth is repeated twice here, 
the first time is written in the call infinitive absolute. Now, what in the world does that mean, somebody might be saying? The call infinitive absolute. We know the call stem means that you need to interpret this literally. I'm not being hypothetical with you here. Now, the infinitive absolute changes a verb into a descriptive noun, is what it does. So now he is describing this man and woman, He's the female and the male in this situation that are abusing the boy. He's describing them. That is what the call infinitive does. It reveals that the verb is being used as a descriptive noun and that the condition it depicts should be interpreted literally and they call infinitive absolute. So the two are genuinely dead. They are already destroyed. They are literally deprived of life. And shall forever cease to exist. This is the second application of Muth. It was Muth Muth. This time we find the second Muth written in the hopeful stem and in the imperfect conjugation. The hopeful stem reveals that this will occur passively. This is not go off and kill them. That would be an active command. There is no command here. There is no commit an active act. There is no engage here and kill them. That does not exist. It was written in the hopeful stem. The hopeful stem means that this will occur passively. And that since it's the passive part of the hiffle, it means that the perpetrators of this horrible crime have brought this condition upon themselves. We'll return after the commercial break. Welcome back to Shattering Mist. We're going to return to this uh, statement so that we have an understanding of what God had to say um, from the beginning again. And an individual, this would be a male individual, who actually and habitually lies down and continually has sexual intercourse with a boy. While in bed with a woman, Isha, female, mother or wife, he is genuinely and completely engaged in something repulsive and detestable. The two are genuinely dead, already destroyed, literally deprived of life, and shall forever cease to exist. The second application of Muth. This time written in uh, the hopeful stem and in the imperfect conjugation. The hopeful stem is the passive of the hiffle. Remember in the hiffle, the, uh, the subject uh, causes the object to be a secondary subject and that, and that therefore uh, the, whatever the benefits or the negativity here is of the stem, the subject and, uh, and object um, are, uh, are similarly engaged. But that's in the hiffle, it's active. In the hopeful, it's passive. So this is something that the subjects have brought upon themselves uh, passively. Something that's going to be done to them based upon what they have done is, uh, is the hopeful stem. So based upon what they have done, they will cease to exist. They shall find themselves depatched and eternally annihilated as a result of these actions. The imperfect conjugation means that that this ceasing to exist is eternal. You know, death is a one-time event. You would never write death in the sense of just uh, like, uh, for example, if, if God were trying to say, hey, you should uh, kill them for uh, conducting and uh, committing an act of, uh, of uh, pedophilic homosexuality, uh, you would use uh, the perfect conjugation. You know, do a man, kill him. Uh, he didn't use that. 
And you would use an active uh, verb stem, not a passive one. Uh, here's a passive stem, which has these individuals bringing this upon themselves, and also a, a conjugation which says this is an, a, an everlasting state. When this is done, when they do this to themselves, when they bring this, the condition of ceasing to exist upon themselves, it's forever. It's irreversible. It's ongoing. And God concludes, death is within them. Dham ba. It's perfect. It's exactly what you would expect. God is saying that, you know, there are a lot of things that uh, that are important to me, but nothing is more important to me than my covenant. My covenant is based upon a marriage vow. It's based upon family. It's based upon men and women coming together in love, making a commitment, a vow of marriage, becoming mother and father, raising children in a home, contributing to their children's education, their growth, their nourishment, their education. Because I designed you in a way, God is saying, that I want you to understand who I am and what I'm offering you through this covenant. And therefore, anything that corrupts that among my people has a consequence. And if you choose to so blatantly disregard this model that I've established for marriage and for home and for children... So as to rape your own child on an ongoing basis, then you're walking dead. You are dead to me. At the end of your life, you're going to cease to exist. I want to move on to a different subject. Um, this time it's a report from Turkish Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. Many of you may know that he was accused uh, of uh, um, of having a a very inappropriate conversation with his son. Uh, it appears, based upon the conversation, that this Mr. Erdogan, the Prime Minister of Turkey, who is a fundamentalist Muslim and has made that country essentially a mirror of uh, of his own religious zeal told his son how to deal with uh, ill-gotten gain. And that recording, all Erdogan could say, because it's clearly his voice and clearly his son's voice, is it was cobbled together and that it's not just one conversation and aren't they horrible to wiretap me.